Welcome back everybody to the video lecture on computer graphics. Today we are going to discuss about CRT display devices or cathode ray tube based display devices. In the lecture on introduction to computer graphics of course, we have seen various types of I O devices which are used in the field of computer graphics. And uh, a few of them are used for output as well as a few are used for input. The output devices are the monitors let us say and the input devices are the keyboard or mouse. Uh, let us look at a few examples of computer graphics devices, especially uh, the input and output devices. The CRTs are the cathode ray tubes as they are called. Then we have the EGA, CGA, VGA or SVGA monitors. Enhanced graphics adapter stands for EGA, CGA we have the colored graphics adapter, we have the video graphics adapter VGA and super uh, video graphics adapter SVGA. Plotters various types, data matrix for displays, laser printers, films, flat panel devices, video digitizers, scanners, LCD panels, keyboard, joystick, mouse, touch screen track ball etcetera. So, these are various examples of computer graphics devices. Out of these we are essentially going to discuss in the lecture which is going to follow from here on is the most commonly used display device called the CRT monitors. Of course, there are other types of better uh, display devices which are coming out based on solid state technology. It could be the flat panel devices or the plasma devices. Uh, the organic LEDs and other devices, but most commonly in the world and specifically in our country, uh, most of the display devices are based on CRT monitors. So, what are the different types of CRT display devices which have been there or are available? Okay, the first one of them, the most simplest one, which is the direct view storage tube or DVST. Okay. The second one is the calligraphic or random scan display system. The third one is the refresh and raster scan display system. All these three devices we will discuss in details, but the common part of these display devices are is the concept of the cathode ray tube or CRT. We will first look at the very basic and the simple one which is the DVST or direct view storage tube. The storage tube it is a CRT with a long persistence phosphorus or phosphor. We will see what this means. It provides flicker free display, there is no flicker in the display and it does not need to refresh the contents of the screen. So, these are the three fundamental properties of direct view storage tube or DVST. It essentially the DVST consists of a CRT where we have a slow moving electron beam which draws a line on the screen. We will move to the picture of or the diagram of a CRT and see how this electron beam it is generated and how it is guided on to a particular point on a screen. But this electron beam which is essentially the uh, basic uh, component of the CRT which is responsible for drawing a line on the screen. So, how it is controlled? We will see later on. The screen for a DVST 
or DVST has a storage mesh in which the phosphor is embedded. Image is stored as a distribution of charges on the inside surface of the screen and the DVST has very limited interactive support. Well, this is what is a typical diagram which illustrates the operation of a CRT or a CRT based monitor. Okay? It is an operation which shows how an electron gun with an accelerating anode is used to generate an electron beam which is used to display uh, points or pictures in the screen. On the left hand side of the CRT you have a heating filament which is responsible to heat up the cathode element of the CRT and that is what generates the electrons. The electrons I could say after the heating element is uh, heating this cathode the electrons simply boil off simply boil off from the uh, cathode and it is guided by a set of devices which are essentially all cylindrical in nature and it helps to guide this electronic beam path towards the screen. We have three functions here a control grid, a focusing anode and an accelerating anode. These are three essentially cylindrical devices which are stuck inside the cylindrical CRT uh, um, device and three of these have three independent tasks. What does the control grid do? Well, when you observe a, a picture on a screen, some parts of the picture may be bright or some pictures may be dark. This brightness or darkness or the illumination or intensity on the screen is basically controlled by the intensity of the beam which strikes a particular point on the screen. This intensity of the screen is controlled by controlling the intensity of the electron beam which is coming out of the cathode. Okay, if you look at this picture once again, the electron beam is coming out of the cathode and the intensity of that beam is controlled by the control grid. Now this control grid typically is, uh, now remember the electron beam consists of electrons which are negatively charged. The control grid is a cylindrical device which also is negatively charged. It is a high negative voltage which is applied to the control grid. Now if the, if the electrons are also negatively charged and the control grid is also negatively charged, both of them repel each other. So the amount of the voltage at the control grid will essentially allow a certain amount of electrons of the electron beam to pass through it. Okay? And the amount of electron beam or the amount of electrons which will pass through that cylindrical control grid will be controlled by the negative voltage in the control grid. So if you reduce the amount of voltage in the control grid or that means the negative voltage is reduced, you are allowing more electrons to pass through it and the intensity of the beam will be higher and the amount of intensity on the screen also will be higher. Whereas if you increase the velocity of the, con increase the voltage of the control grid increase the voltage of the control grid, you are allowing less amount of electrons to pass through. The intensity of the electron beam which is passing through the control grid will now be less and you will have less brightness on the screen. So that is the function of the control grid which has negative voltage. The other two parts of the CRT are the focusing anode and the accelerating anode. Well, the structure and the design of the CRT varies from one uh, type of device to another. Uh, sometimes you have the, but essentially you typically have cylindrical structures of the focusing anode or the accelerating anode and both of these device cylindrical devices, the focusing anode and the accelerating anode are actually unlike the control grid, these are positively charged, they will have positive voltage. The control grid had a negative voltage because it had to repel or stop a few electrons from going through if necessary depending upon the intensity of the beam which is required to strike on the screen. The focusing anode and the accelerating anode have two different tasks but essentially they have what I will call as positive voltage because essentially the focusing anode is responsible to the focus 
the beam onto a particular point on the screen. It is similar to a lens focusing a beam of light on a particular point on the screen. Instead of focusing light, we are actually focusing the electrons onto a particular spot or point on the on the screen. Okay. So, that is the job of the focusing anode. Again, it is uh, we can say it is an electrostatic lens. That means, it is focusing the electron beams unlike an optical lens which focuses focuses the beams uh, on the uh, and, and a light beam onto a surface. In this case, an electron beam is focused onto the screen. An accelerating anode is necessary because we want the electrons to strike the screen at a very high speed to emit light. So, the acceleration of the beam is provided to also by the accelerating anode which also has a positive voltage. It allows the electrons to accelerate and then leaves it towards the screen. So, till now we have seen that the electron beam path in this picture is going straight after it has passed through these three stages. The first stage controls the intensity, the second stage controls the focusing, the third stage uh, it gives it the speed or the acceleration. Now, this will go and strike the center of the screen. This will go and strike the center of the screen as it is going straight. What happens or what, uh, uh, how will you implement the deflections of the beam? Because the screen is basically a square matrix. So, you need not only the beam to go and hit the center of the screen to create a point, but you also need this beam to move all around this image if you want to create a picture. Okay. So, you need horizontal deflection as well as vertical deflections of this electron beam, so that you can cover the entire screen. All the points or entire phosphor coating of the screen should be covered. Okay. So, you need to deflect. This deflection of the beam is implemented by another stage, which we will see in the next slide. Basic design of a magnetic deflection CRT. This is a diagram where we only show that there exists an electron gun with a focusing system at the base of the CRT. It does not of course, show the other components like the uh, accelerating and the control uh, systems, which is part of what we will commonly term as a part of the electron gun at the base of the CRT. In fact, the electron gun terminology is typically used which consists of the stages of accelerating anodes and also the uh, stages of the control grid to control the intensity. But after the beam is focused, it comes out almost in a straight path and it has to be deflected. So, if you look at the diagram, this beam is deflected by magnetic deflection coils which actually are uh, on the top, bottom and on the two opposite sides also uh, of the CRT. And this magnetic deflection coil generates a magnetic field which helps to deviate or divert this magnetic or this electron beam onto any portion on the screen, okay, on the phosphor coated screen. So, this is one mechanism by which the deflection could be obtained for an electron beam. We move on to the next picture, which shows that this deflection is also possible with the help of electrostatic fields. The previous one was a electromagnetic field generated by magnetic coils. In this case, electrostatic fields generated by capacitance deflection plates. So, we are talking of electrostatic deflection of the CRT, electrostatic deflection of the electron beam in a CRT. And we have the same base electron gun focusing system and then the beam comes out straight and passes through, through two plates. You can assume these to be capacitive plates generating an electrostatic field. And the first stage as seen in the picture, we have the horizontal deflection plates, the horizontal deflection plates which is responsible for horizontal deflection of the electron beam and then it passes through the vertical deflection plates which is responsible for vertical deflection of the electron beam. If you look now, the horizontal deflection plates essentially are vertical plates through which the electron beam is passing. Assume these to be horizontal deflection plates which are essentially vertical uh, uh, aligned or positioned and the electron, the electrostatic field helps the beam to rotate or deviate or divert in horizontal direction. The vertical deflection plates are physically horizontal 
but it generates an electrostatic field which is vertically oriented and that is the reason why this is responsible for vertical deflection of the electron beam. So, these two together helps you to position or divert the beam at any point on the phosphor coated screen on the right hand side which you can see here. So, essentially there are two types of deflection mechanisms, one is uh, based on the uh, capacitive uh, electrostatic mechanism, another by electromagnetic using magnetic coils. So, do two types of deflection mechanisms are possible in a CRT and these are diagrams which illustrate what is essentially in it. The CRTs which are used in an oscilloscope for electronic experiments typically will have the deflection plates whereas, the TV monitors typically will use magnetic coils for deflection you can see that almost for yourself of course, you have to open it and see, but that is typically the standard which is used. Okay. Coming back to DVST or direct view storage tube in which the CRT is a very essential part of course, almost all of these uh, display devices will have some sort of uh, mechanisms of electron gun with deflection plates or magnetic coils to deflect the plates. So, the CRT is essentially a common part of all the three different type of uh, storage, uh, three different types of uh, display devices. We are discussing about direct view storage tubes. We have seen a few of uh, the essential parts, but DVST or direct view storage tubes have very limited applications. That is because they have very serious, serious drawbacks and the first drawback is that modifying any part of the image, it requires redrawing the entire modifying image. If you want to modify any part, you have to modify the entire image. So, the animation uh, uh, is almost ruled out when you are using direct view storage tubes. That is the first drawback. The number two, changing in the image requires to generate a new charge distribution in the DVST. That means, we were saying that we have a phosphor coated screen on the front and the beam is allowed to go and strike at any point. The deflection is attended is attained by the reflection coils or electrostatic fields and whenever the phosphor is struck by the electron beam, it emits light. Okay. That is the mechanism by which you draw the picture or the picture is visible. Okay. And now, when you need to modify some part, this beam has to go and do that on the entire screen and that is why the change in the image requires you to generate a new charge distribution in the phosphor coated screen in the case of a DVST and the process is usually very slow. That is my next point. It is a slow process of drawing it takes typically a few seconds to draw a very complex picture. DVST requires, I repeat again, a few seconds to draw quite a good amount of complex picture. You, you can erase a picture, erasing takes about 0.5 seconds and all lines and characters must be erased in the screen. Remember characters are also uh, drawn by drawing short strokes or short lines in the DVST. And you can say virtually no animation is possible when you are using a DVST uh, mechanism. It is it's, it's something like a highly static picture which is visible. You can erase and redraw it again something like what you see uh, in a cathode ray oscilloscope a CRO for electronic experiments. Uh, uh, you almost get a static picture of course, with variation, but it is redrawn. It is redrawn. Okay. We move to the next type of uh, device which is uh, probably closer to the TV monitors which we use today, not exactly same. They are called the calligraphic or random scan display system. I repeat calligraphic or random scan display system and we see how this is different from uh, the DVST. It is much improved. It is also called a vector, vectored stroke or line drawing displays. Okay characters for the random scan, we will henceforth call this is a random scan display or a line drawing display, calligraphic term is also used, but we will call it as a random scan. Characters are also made up of sequence of strokes or short lines. Okay. You cannot draw a complete character without drawing short lines, that is what it, it basically means. It is also called a vectored because the electron beam is deflected from one end point to another and those sequence of commands which helps the electron beam from electron beam to move from one point to another in order to draw such short strokes or lines 
uh, are called um, sort of vector type of movement and hence it is called a, um, due to the vector type of movement or definitions of the picture in terms of lines, characters made of lines and so on, it is called also called a vectored system. It is also called a random scan because there is no strict order. The order of deflection of the beam is basically dictated by the arbitrary order of the display commands. So, since there is no strict order, the order could be any in any random form that is why it is also called a random scan because the order of deflection uh, there is no strict rule and it is dictated by the order of the display commands based on which the beam is deflected. The phosphor is different. The phosphor on the screen in the case of a random scan is different from the that of a uh, direct view storage tube or DVST because DVST had a long persistence phosphor. Okay, in this case the phosphor has a short persistence and the illumination of the phosphor, the light which it emits once an electron beam strikes a phosphor, we know it emits light. Okay. The amount of time uh, over which the phosphor emits light after the electron beam is withdrawn uh, is called a short persistence, we will come to that definition, but that decay of the amount of light which it emits uh, in the case of a random scan that decays very fast. Whereas, in the case of a DVST which had long persistence, the light was on for a very long time and that is why uh, um, the uh, once it is drawn, it, was there, it used to be there for a quite a long time and the decay in the case of a random scan is in the order of about 10 to 100 microsecond, typically in the order of about fraction of a millisecond is what you can say that the phosphor has a short persistence. So, that means the picture must be redrawn the beam must come back to that point otherwise the that point will st stop emitting light. Okay. So, there is a need for refresh this is the first thing which we are getting that the display must be refreshed each point the beam must come back to that point after a very short time otherwise uh, uh, the picture will simply vanish from the screen and it is true for all the points in the screen for a random scan display. Okay. The display must be refreshed at regular intervals of time and minimum recommendation is as you see on the screen 30 hertz or 30 frames per second FPS. We will talk of this frame in a very short while, we will see what is this frame, but you can say you can you can safely assume that the frame is just one picture, this one full picture is one frame. So, this frame must be revisited or recreated at about 30 times per second or 30 frames per second or a frequency of 30 hertz is the frequency of refreshing the skin that is minimum recommended for what I will call as a flicker free display. This, this unit of 30 hertz or 30 frames per second comes out from the concept of persistence of the vision of the eye not to do with the screen parameters or display parameters. There is a persistence of vision for which if a picture is presented very at, uh, uh, um, uh, at, at a higher rate with very short gaps. Uh, in terms of even milliseconds, you will see a consistent or a constant picture or a flicker free display. If you reduce it to below 30 or 25 hertz, this shot will start to or the screen will start to flicker in front of your, front of your eye. So, to provide flicker free display, you must provide uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, refreshing mechanism must operate at 30 hertz or more. Okay? And since we talk of a refresh, the first time we are introducing the concept of graphics memory which comes into play in a big way, we will call it as a refresh buffer, okay. it is part of a system memory buffer or the system memory which is used basically for refreshing or the memory picture contents or the commands for the random scan are kept there in the refresh buffer. It is defined as a memory space as you can see in the screen, a memory space allocated to store the display list or display program, the program which creates the display list uh, uh, that means the commands which are to be used to draw the pictures, strokes, lines, etcetera and which are used by the CPU or the display processor to draw the picture is, uh, is kept in a refresh buffer. Of course, I have not given you the architecture of a simple or a general purpose computer graphic system, we will come to that in a moment, but refresh buffer is a very important component or part, component or part of the graphic system where the entire display program, the entire display program is basically kept. 
the display processor, the CPU itself could act as a display processor, but you can have a dedicated display processor inside your computer graphics system which could do the task of computer graphics or run your programs or algorithms of computer graphics without overloading or disturbing the CPU, correct? Because if the computer uh, graphics uh, CPU does the computer graphics job for, for you which are highly computationally intensive or overloaded then uh, the system performance may go down. So, it is better to have a display processor which can do the computer graphics operations for you, correct. So, the computer, so the computer graphics system will have a display processor in general and it interprets these commands which are there in the refresh buffer, the display program or the display list and uh, uh, it also interprets these commands in the refresh buffer for plotting, okay. The display processor must also cycle through the display list to refresh the phosphor, okay. That is, is another task and the display program has commands for point plotting, line plotting and also character plotting. We will I think go through now the conceptual block diagram is probably not an architecture truly, but a block diagram will give you the architecture in a very short time. The conceptual block diagram of a calligraphic or random um, uh, scan refresh display. Uh, calligraphic refresh or random refresh is what you can talk about. So, on the left hand side you can see we have a host CPU here which drives your graphics processor or picture processor which in turn loads the contents of your graphics screen or the picture on a display buffer or the refresh buffer which we talked about and the contents of the display buffer are passed on to a display controller. Okay. The display controller has some specific jobs, we will come to that in a moment and it uh, interprets this display buffer contents and passes it on to a vector character generator which is basically uh, the interface to the CIT, it will generate all the analog voltages which are necessary for the deflection of the beam. Deflection of the beam and the intensity of the beam are all generated by the display controller and also by the vector character generator and that is passed on the CRT for display. This is one model, I put this is a display one because this is one conceptual bag block diagram for uh, uh, the display device. You can have a slight modified diagram of the display dis refresh display, I will say it is two, a conceptual block diagram which is slightly modified. As you can see the modification is that the, the picture processor here which was actually just after the host CPU in the previous figure has come down after the display buffer or after the display controller. That is possible, it depends upon what sort of framework you want to have, sometimes it is necessary to put the picture processor after the display buffer or display controller which will interpret the commands and do some processing very fast. I do not want the host CPU to be overloaded with computer graphics commands or computer graphics algorithms too much. It will just say I want one this, this pictures with certain output primitives. We talked about output primitives in the introduction lecture where the primitives consists of lines field regions, characters and so on. So, I want the picture process or the graphics processor to do certain operations on these output primitives and I do not want the CPU to do that. So, the CPU might just send that I want these output primitives drawn at this, this point with these, these attributes or features and the picture processor has to interpret, the picture processor has to interpret these commands from the display buffer and generate correspondingly short short descriptions for the vector character generator. If you see the screen now, the picture processor interprets from the controller and sends signals to the vector character generator to generate uh, the corresponding signals of the CRT. I we revisit the block diagram 1 back again and the block diagram 2. If you compare this as we go back and forth, the position of the picture processor has changed basically. In the case of the block diagram 1, as you see here now, it was next to the CPU and it was driving the display buffer. In the case of block diagram 2, the CPU drives the display buffer and the picture processor takes input from the display controller and gives it to the vector generator. It is question of an implementation which one suits one's requirement in terms of designing a, uh, a computer graphic system. You can put the processor just after the CPU or after the refresh buffer, okay. So, we go back and continue on random scan display systems. The display processor we typically assume one of the two models of uh, the block diagram, it sends digital and point coordinate values to a vector generator. We will see the meanings of what we mean by digital and point coordinate values. Well, it is something like this, the vector generator needs to know what line you need to draw 
from what point x1 y1 to point x2 y2 on the screen and it also needs to know what should be the intensity of this line. I repeat it needs coordinate values x1 y1 to x2 y2 from which point to the end point, first point to the second point it needs to draw a line and also the intensity of that line. So, if you come back to the screen that means you need to say not only point coordinate values, but a digital value for the intensity that is what is given to uh, the vector generator by the display processor after interpreting the command. Okay. The vector generator converts the digital coordinate values to analog voltage for the beam reflection circuits because it must know from which point x1 y1 to which point x2 y2 it must draw. So, the beam has to be deflected first, switched off and deflected to the point x1 y1, then switched on with a particular intensity and the reflection voltage must be set in such a manner that the beam is deflected slowly in a linear manner uh, to another point x2 y2. So, the vector generator does all such tasks, generates in fact these analog voltages from digital coordinate values and digital intensity values. Okay. The beam deflection circuits displays the electron beam for writing on the CRT's phosphor coating. Okay. That is true of course, when the beam moves and is switched on, the phosphor gets the beam and it starts emitting light at all those points. Recommended rate was 30 hertz. Uh, usually is the minimum requirement was 30 hertz, but the refresh rate recommended is 40 to 50 hertz to absolutely have complete flicker free display. Typically about 50 even 60 hertz is better to go beyond that. Okay. Scope of animation is possible in a random scan or calligraphic display. It was not possible in the case of a DVST, but it had li it has limited support. It has limited support, the random scan has limited support of animation. We will say that the scope of animation lies with segmentation. What do you mean by segmentation here? You have a mixture of static parts and dynamic parts of a picture. I will say I have two regions or two segments of a picture. Some part it could be static, some part could be dynamic where I will create the animation. That is possible in the case of random scan. The static part I will draw once, I need to refresh that all right, but the contents of that static part in my display list or display program in the refresh buffer, which was a sequence of commands that is never going to change. Because so when I refresh, I keep on refreshing the display list or display program in terms of the short, short lines I draw on the screen. There is another region which I will call as a dynamic part of my of the scene, a, a small part may not be the, the whole part. That small part is responsible for the dynamics uh, or the animation of the screen and there the contents could change. How do I change that contents? Typically, I go back to the refresh buffer and say I have a dynamic part in my refresh buffer where the contents could change. I could write there from the CPU or I could write that contents from the picture processor. Those contents of drawing the lines, instead of drawing a line from x1, y1 to x2, y2, I say I will change. What do I implement by animation? I will say next I will draw a line from a point x3, y3 to x4, y4. So, I had a line from x1 y1 to x2 y2 and after some time if I draw a line from x3 y3 to x4 y4. So, I will first see a line like this and I will see another line like this that will create animation for me. So, I can implement that in a short part of the screen for a random or calligraphic display system and I need to update the refresh buffer just the uh, animated part, the dynamic part of the refresh buffer which will create animation for me. The rest part could be static, I do not change the contents, but I keep refreshing the entire display list or entire display program that I need to update it because the static part also has to be refreshed along with the dynamic part. The dynamic part changes, but the static part is all static, there is absolutely no change. The random scan display system basically draws a set of lines in any order. We talked about that there is no strict order, that is why it is called random, but it essentially draws lines. Okay. How does it draw it? Just look at this mechanism. Okay. We assume we have a screen here and then an electron gun and the blue line is the electron beam which is you know uh, hitting at one point of the phosphor on the screen. Okay. And assume that this beam is switched on and it starts to move. As it starts to move, wherever it hits the phosphor screen all that will start emitting light. Let us say the beam, have, the beam has moved in linear manner and it has also turned. So, you see all that part wherever the beam has scanned so far it you start eliminating or emitting light and of course, you can dictate what sort of color you want and all that. Okay. So, this is the second stage. You keep on moving the beam more and let us say this picture shows where it has moved now. So, you can almost see what I am trying to draw. I have finished one line, I have finished the second line and I am moving towards the third line. So, I am probably going to draw a triangle okay. and it is all these points on the triangle where the beam has moved, they are all 
emitting still emitting light short persistence but still emitting light because this is happening very fast at about 30 40 hertz okay and when the entire picture is completed the beam comes back to that particular point a full triangle is drawn essentially what i have drawn i have made the beam to travel from vertex x1 y1 from a vertex x1 y1 to another vertex x2 y2 to a third vertex x3 y3 and come back to x1 y1 i have done in this figure basically i have drawn a triangle by making the beam move from first vertex to second vertex to third vertex and come back i repeat again x1 y1 to x2 y2 to x3 y3 and then come back again to x1 y1 i finish the cycle and then i am able to draw a triangle that's what i have drawn these four shots of the figure shows that essentially i have finished a triangle but the job doesn't end there the job doesn't end there because you have to refresh the display and the same thing keeps happening again and again that the that the, uh, the the electron beam moves again from vertex 1 to vertex 2 to vertex 3 and comes back to x1 and this cycle keeps on going at around 40 to 50 hertz and you see only a triangle with a certain intensity so and this order of drawing that is also very important I can move from point x1 y1 to point x2 y2 to x3 y3 and come back or nobody stops me from traversing or making the move making the electron beam move from point x1 y1 to point x2 y2 to point x3 y3 and then come back to point x1 y1 I can move in any order I can start from a third vertex move to first vertex and move to a number it is only basically an order which is important and the order is not that important but the points are important so that you create these three lines in any order and uh, you and since you are refreshing uh, at 30 40 hertz you get a flicker free static display of this triangle okay let us see how this line drawing can be generated in a random scan or calligraphic scan display this is an ideal line drawing forget the uh, part of the filling part we will see how uh, region filling can be done with the help of again line drawing but let us worry about only the lines draw. we have a house with a window and a door and there is a moon do not worry about the uh, filling part I have done the filling myself to uh, give it a slightly better appearance but uh, do not worry and do not think about how to fill those regions I am bothered about the lines being drawn and again just keep in mind the region filling is nothing but again a set of line drawings for the time being okay so how do you do that is an ideal output I want and you see it on the screen when you are watching this TV monitor actually uh, something is getting refreshed over this over and above these lines okay so how do you start we do it by a vector scan method or a random scan method and this is the screen which is blank so what I do is the beam is somewhere beam is somewhere and the screen is switched off and it is switched off but it must be diverted to one of the points starting point somewhere let us say this is my trace this is not my actual beam okay this is the this is the point this dashed line shows that the beam is switched off and it is moved from one point to another and that point here with the arrow points to is nothing but the top left vertex of the rectangle structure on the left hand side this is the point the ideal line this vertex is where the beam has come and stopped and it is switched off now what I do is now watch I draw this small rectangular field region and the arrow mark show in what order I draw the lines okay I hope it is clear that I basically draw four lines there and the beam is switched on at this point the beam is switched on and traverse it first moves horizontally then vertically down then horizontally left and then vertically up so it basically finishes a, tri a, a rectangle a small rectangular strip is drawn by switching on this beam and traversed in this fashion when it when it moves in the horizontal direction there is one uh, you need horizontal deflection voltages to be switched on when it is moving in the vertical direction you need the vertical aims to be vertical deflection voltage to be switched on the other voltages can be switched off so the beam was off that blue dashed line shows that the beam was off and it has been brought to that vertex the vertex here this vertex it has come and then it has moved like this horizontally right vertically down horizontally left and then horizontally vertically up again and just come back to this point let us say and the rectangle done of course the filling also will be done next we need to draw the other figure what do you do you switch off the beam you switch off the beam and move it you switch off the beam and move it uh, the path is shown again by the dashed blue line where the beam is switched off and it moves and it is meant to draw the next rectangle here this is how it is drawn remember I am trying to keep an arbitrary order here 
you can start with the house, draw the moon, come back to this rectangle, absolutely no problem. I have drawn the reverse way, I am drawn the two rectangles first and we will see what is drawn next. So that is what I mean by random order. Not only that, not only in terms of what type of structures I am drawing in sequence, to implement a particular rectangle also as you can see, the second rectangle is drawn in a different order. The first rectangle was drawn in an order where I move horizontally right, vertically down, horizontally left, vertically up. In this case, it is completely different. Just the reverse track or trajectory is what I do. I make, the, I switch on the beam here, bring it vertically down, take it horizontally right, take it vertically up and then finally horizontally left, just the reverse order. So I can follow any order of drawing lines, that is the most basic thing which you must understand in terms of random scan. As long as the pictures are drawn, does not matter in what order you are drawing. Okay? So these two triangles are drawn. Now I need to complete two other figures, the moon and the outside structure of the building. So what do I do? I move to some other point. I am probably moving here. I move here to draw the moon first. The beam is again switched off. I keep repeating uh, dashed discontinuous blue lines are the trajectory for when the beam is switched off. Continuous black lines, the beam is switched on. So the beam is switched off and it has gone to the place where it has drawn, it has to draw the moon, it is it draws it like this. Now it is essentially drawing two curves. These curves are also implemented using short lines. Okay? So it draws the right hand trajectory, goes up, goes to the top vertex of the moon and then comes back. The arrows indicate the trajectory by which the lines move and you go here and come back and the moon is drawn. The beam is again has to be switched off because it has to be taken to one of the points where you have to start to draw the house. Okay? So it is a vector scan and you have to implement the ideal line drawing on the left hand side. The, the part which is now left is the house. So you have to switch off the beam, take it to one of the points. So we have come back to the point which is the left vertex, left top vertex of the house and we start to draw. Let us see how it is drawn. The beam is, has been switched off and it has traversed from right to left along the dashed uh, blue line. You switch it on now and then start moving it diagonally across to the top vertex diagonally down right to one of the vertices there, then vertically down, horizontally left, beam is on, beam is on and then finally vertically up. That completes the entire diagram. As you can see, if I take off the blue lines from the ideal, from the diagram on the right hand side which is a vector scan, you are basically uh, and the arrow marks of course, then you get the ideal line drawing. Okay? If you take out, I repeat the arrow marks and the blue lines blue lines on the screen which typically I repeat again indicates the trajectory of the beam movement when it is switched off. The blue lines dash discontinuous lines indicate the trajectory when it is switched off and continuous black lines indicate the trajectory when it is switched on. If you remove those markers and the arrow markers you basically get back the ideal line drawing. So this is a mechanism by which a drawing is done in a vector scan or random scan mode and of course the activity does not stop. The entire thing is repeated again and again at a rate of 40 frames per second, at least 30 frames per second so that you do not have flicker. If, you, if, if it is drawn at a rate of about 10 or 20 frames per second or as low as about 5 frames per second, you will start to having flicker on the screen. To avoid the flicker on the screen, you must present this entire cycle which I showed you with the animation just now must be repeated at around 40 to 50 frames per second or 40 hertz frequency of refresh rate so that you have a flicker free display otherwise you will start to have flicker on the screen. Minimum recommended rate is 30 hertz. Okay? So continuing with the random scan display system, we come to these terms which you have been using in terms of the phosphorus material properties of a, are emitting light when an electron beam strikes the screen. The first term which you must know in terms of uh, uh, the CRT's display device and the phosphorus coating is the phosphorus fluorescence. I repeat, phosphorus fluorescence is the light emitted, you can read, is the light emitted as electrons or unstable electrons. The unstable means they are, they are flying through the vacuum. The CRT inside is a vacuum and the electrons simply fly in a straight line. They can be diverted uh, by the magnetic coils or electrostatic plates, obviously, but they are unstable. And uh, these unstable electrons, they fly and they lose their excess energy in terms of uh, kinetic energy while it strikes the phosphor. 
okay and uh, um, so we are talking of the fluorescence is the light emitted as these electrons lose their excess energy while the phosphor is being struck by those electrons. So the phosphor is struck, struck by an electron the electrons lose their energy uh, from unstable state they are moving towards four state and that energy is all emitted by by means, uh, means of two uh, um, energies one is the heat energy dissipated at that point the number one the number two is the light energy. So very 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 short time the light will be emitted and go off the beam must come back otherwise that uh, if you want to light to be emitted at that particular point where the beam is struck uh, 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 continuously you have to refresh it again by the beam at that point because the light is emitted for a very short time fraction of a millisecond and it again goes dim. But the fluorescence definition talks about that light emitted as electrons lose their excess energy while the phosphor is being struck by electrons. Phosphorescence is another term. Phosphorescence is the light given off by the return of the relatively more stable excited electrons to their unexcited state once the electron beam excitation is removed. Fluorescence was the light emitted at the point when it was struck and the excess energy is being dissipated. Phosphorescence is the decay, basically the light given off by the return of the relatively more stable excited electrons to their unexcited state once the electron beam excitation is removed. So I take off the beam, as the beam is struck I have a fluorescence coming out. As I take out, this is a phosphorescence which talks about the light which is coming out but it will decay with time. Okay, that small amount of time for which the light energy is emitted is dictated by the phosphorescence property of the phosphor. Phosphorus persistence is defined as the time from the removal of excitation to the moment when phosphorescence has decayed to 10 percent of the initial light output. I did say that the decay is exponential. The phosphorescence which the term which we coined number 2 in this slide is the decay which is exponential, but we did not talk about the time. We did not talk about the time and uh, uh, the time over which this decay takes place and it has almost gone down to if not 0 about 10 percent of the original light output that is the fluorescence which was coming out when the beam was being struck, the beam is being removed, phosphorescence takes place and the persistence talks about the time, the time duration over which the, uh, the time duration over which the, the phosphorus, phosphorescence starts from an initial value exponential decay mind you and reaches about 10 percent of the original value. So that is the exponential path by which the decay takes place and that amount of time typically if you have for those with electronics and electrical background can compare this decay time with an RC discharge. Uh, time decay in uh, electrical electronic circuits which is used in most digital analog circuits as well. Um, that amount of uh, time is called the phosphorus persistence. There is a decay which is exponential the time is persistence and the concept is phosphorescence. Long persistence remember DVST direct view storage tube has a long persistence which could run for several seconds. So you can draw it and wait and redraw it again after a long time refresh may not be there or if it is there it could be sluggish. Short persistence for a random scan display system takes about 10 to 60 microseconds which is common in most modern displays. The short persistence exists with random scan displays. The time which we have for this recording I will just introduce one slide of refresh and raster scan display systems and wind up the lecture and the next lecture will continue on the refresh and raster scan. We have discussed two types of display devices. I think in this lecture I must introduce the third display device before winding up, but we will talk about more details about the third display device later on in the next lecture. I have introduced a DVST direct view storage tube, I have introduced a calligraph or random scan display system and we talked about architecture of display systems, we talk about the diagram of a CRT and the third display device which is much better than the previous two is called a refresh or a raster scan display system. The refresh and the raster scan display system is used in most modern display systems including television screens. How it is different? The DVST and the random scan display systems were essentially line drawing devices. We had seen how the line drawing was used to draw the line, draw the picture of the house with door and a window and the moon they were all drawing lines. The refresh CRT or the raster scan CRT, remember it is different from random scan forget DVST. 
comparing random scan and refresh scan or raster scan these terms are used interchangeably i can use the term refresh and raster they are meaning the same or i can use refresh raster they basically mean the same thing the third type of display device which i am talking about is different from random scan in the sense that the random scan was a line drawing device or a line drawing system like the device dvst or direct view storage tube the refresh crt as given here in this line is basically a point plotting device things appear to be very tough but it gives you a lot of advantages you draw points here unless like drawing lines in the case of random scan that's the essential difference you must keep in mind the raster display stores the display primitives like lines characters shaded areas or patterned areas in a refresh buffer remember the raster display stores the display primitives we talked about display primitives like lines characters and areas in a refresh buffer the random scan also stored this the random scan also stored this in a refresh buffer but it stored with the help of storing lines in this case it stores also lines but with the help of points the refresh buffer also called the frame buffer we'll use these terms interchangeably the refresh buffer is also called the frame buffer which stores the drawing primitives in terms of points and pixel coordinates rather than storing line commands draw line or long drawing commands were essentially the tools or the basic utilities for random scan or dvst in this case we are talking of points or pixel components to store the drawing primitives in the case of a refresh or raster scan this is the architecture of the typical raster graphic system a typical computer system will have all of these except maybe the video controller where the system the monitor could be directly driven from the system memory but essentially any sort of video controller is essential we have the system bus and input output devices like the keyboard or the mouse or some other io devices we have the central processing unit which typically does all the task of monitoring the system as well as uh, computer graphics commands if necessary if you don't have a separate graphics processor we have a system memory the refresh buffer could be a part of the system memory the video controller could take commands through the cpu through the system bus from the cpu the commands are all in the system memory or frame buffer and the video controller is the one which converts the line drawing primitives and draws it on the screen or the monitor okay so that's the typical architecture of a simple raster graphic system which does not have a graphics processor we will see in the next lecture a slightly more complex architecture of a raster graphic system where you have a graphics processor and a separate frame buffer identified from the system memory and then we will see how these components are used to design a refresh or a raster scan system and then how we'll see how it is going to be different from the way random scan display systems were used to draw pictures with the help of lines in this case using the refresh buffer we use points to draw random scan uh, raster scan as given in this slide raster scan are drawn with the help of points random scan are drawn with the help of lines and we'll also need a few more uh, functionalities are a modified advanced architecture of a graphic system with the use of frame buffer with the use of uh, picture processor separately to draw a screen so we wind up and we move over to the next lecture when we discuss more details more specifics about raster or refresh raster scan display systems thank you very much Thank you.